Hello there, and a very warm welcome to this week's quick tip. Since you seem to have liked last week's charts and explanations, I thought about what to do in the future, and I decided on a mini series of tutorials all revolving around the intricacies of a past tracer. So, this week, even though it overlaps with last week's lecture, I decided on explaining sampling. Now, sampling is a very global approach and all of the render engines have it. Without sampling, there wouldn't be any rendering. So in this week's lecture, I will be going over how sampling is working in most modern render engines, including Octane. So if you like that thematic approach, in following lectures, I thought about going over, for example, GI clamp, ray depth, and other features of that sort, cumulating in a quick tip about the optimization of Octane. And of course, write me in the comments down below if you like that idea, or if you are more advanced and think that other tutorials or quick tips might be better fitting for you. And now, without further ado, and without more delays, let's get started. So, welcome to our small sampling scene. This is not a 2D presentation this time, I built everything in 3D. So, no chart time, unfortunately. Again, a small disclaimer. I am not a computer scientist, and I don't exactly know how the algorithms work behind the scenes of a sampler. What I want to do with this presentation here is just give you a rundown about how the sampling roughly works, so you have a grasp on it, and hopefully that leads to a better understanding and therefore a better use of the renderer. This scene is very simplistic, so it contains a camera, a light source, and a floor object. Of course, your scene might be a little bit more sophisticated, but in general, all the things I explain here also happen in a more complicated scene, but this of course would make the explanation unnecessarily more complicated. So let's get over this with a simple scene, with this simple scene, and start by looking through our scene camera. Here we go. So when looking through a scene camera and the ray tracer or pass tracer needs to render the image, it will shoot rays into the scene, and this is called sampling. Now, we could end our tutorial right now, but there's a lot more intricacies that we can talk about. So, first of all, the pattern in which the samples are shot is very important for the gathering of our information. So, let's start with a pattern that was used in older renderers, and this is a grid sized pattern. Now, the grid size pattern has the advantage that it is covering the whole scene very uniformly, but of course there is a disadvantage, and this is that regular patterns emphasize stair-stepping or aliasing a lot. So, this pattern was not used anymore in newer render engines. When the render engineer is trying to find patterns for the sampling algorithms, they next tried just random sampling, something like this. Now there's an inherent problem with random sampling, where the samples just shot randomly into the scene. You can see there are areas where the sampling rate is very high, and thus the information in this area is also very high and resolved quite nicely while in other areas there is barely any if no samples, and of course then there is a lack of information and no data at all. So the good thing about randomness is that it dissolves the render without stair-stepping or aliasing, but now we get a lot more noise because we have to resolve all the image parts and we need a lot of samples to get coverage of all the areas in our image, and by doing that, there is the chance of oversampling some other areas that already had dense sample patterns on there. So, clearly, this is also not the solution. We got rid of our aliasing artifacts, but we introduced new problems. So, actually, there's a third pattern 
This is basically a combination of the former two of the grid and the randomness. We want to distribute our samples very uniformly without being a grid. So something like this. Patterns like this gives us the best of both worlds because they have an irregularity to them, but also not giving us big holes in the sampling pattern that we would need to spend more time on to sample correctly. This sampling pattern is a blue noise pattern and there basically are a lot of algorithm and there's also going on a lot of research in this field to give you the sort of best pattern that is resolving the noise the best possible way. Now, when we are dealing with patterns like this, for example, blue noise needs a preset max amount of samples to be working, and Octane is a progressive renderer. So I'm not quite sure what algorithm Octane is using. For the first few samples in the newest Octane version, it's using blue noise. And I think for later samples, it will use something like Quasi Monte Carlo. So the random pattern we just looked at was something like Monte Carlo, meaning that they are sampled in a very random way, while Quasi Monte Carlo tries to even out the sampling a little bit more, while at the same time being random. So let's call it Quasi Random. And this is what it's called. All right. So for explanation purposes, I have shown this over the whole field of view, but usually you have pixels. So let's show the pixels. Here we go. We have now a resolution about 88 to 50. It's a very low resolution. I chose this because I wanted you to see every pixel and not rely on screen size pixels. So if we zoom into one pixel of those, you will find that there is a sampling pattern that is much smaller than I showed for my explanation that was just distributed over the whole field of view. In reality, every pixel receives an enormous amount of samples, and this is what makes our images noise-free in the end. Okay, let's move out of the camera and let's look at the scene a little bit. So if we talk about sampling, that means shooting a lot of rays into our scene. And this is also why GPUs are so good at this. Shooting rays into the scene can be very easily parallelized because every ray is doing its own thing and it doesn't care about other rays and what they're doing. So GPUs usually have a lot of cores or a lot of compute units. So every one of those compute units can just chew the information for one ray and therefore accumulate them through the pixels and then feed them back to get our rendered image. Let's look at the example of one camera array here. So let's get rid of all the rays and then just shoot one ray. Let's pretend our floor is slightly reflective, so we get a reflection ray, and then we get an important sampling ray. That means from the point where the camera ray is hitting, here, we shoot a ray directly to the light source. And this can be done because the renderer knows where the light source is and can calculate the direction. Now, if we have glossy reflections or reflections with a roughness, we will shoot more rays than one in the rough direction of the initial reflection. Probably I will talk about BSDFs or bidirectional scattering distribution functions in another session here. But basically what differentiates them is the weighting of the roughness reflections here. So you can put a lot of weight in the direction where the main reflection ray would go, or you can distribute them differently. And if you're asking yourself why we need so many rays, this is because we need to gather information for all of those rays to bring back to the camera ray and then bring back to the pixel to get a noise-free image.
So if we move our rays around, then of course the reflection is going to behave differently than the direct light ray because the reflection is dependent on the incoming angle and that is driving the outgoing angle. While the direct light ray always hits the light directly. All right, so when we move the light, of course, the same happens. The ray follows the light and will always hit the light or trying to hit it. Of course, if the light is hiding behind the object, the ray will hit the object instead of the light. And this is also what gets us a little bit of complication when rendering caustics. I'm referring to last week's video. If you want to know more about that, then I hope the title card comes into play now. Last but not least, there is another thing that comes with the sampling here, and this is the diffuse sampling. So our global illumination is where the camera ray hits, we get a sampling pattern in all possible directions with a 180 degree dome or a hemispherical pattern. Also, those patterns for the reflection as well the pattern for the 180 degree dome are quasi Monte Carlo patterns. So they try to sample in a way that there is no holes inside of the pattern here, but also make sure that the pattern are not grid-like. Of course, there are more sample scenarios as refractions, rough refractions, subsurface scattering, and fog volumes and so on. But basically they all follow the same procedure. They spend a lot of rays tracing around the scene and in the end accumulating all the data and averaging that data color that is into one pixel. And the more rays they are shot, the better the average value is throughout the scene because more rays are shot throughout the scene that can gather more data. So the average is a lot better than with just only a couple of rays. And therefore the noise in our grid, in our pixel grid, resolves. And this is basically how sampling works. So last but not least, let's have a look at a real world scene. So no funky graphics, but the real deal. As you might have noticed, I have rendered this scene with a max sample count of 1. That means this is 1 sample per pixel. If you have ever wondered what SPP means, this is exactly it. It means sample per pixel. So we have 1 sample per pixel right now. And we can already see quite nicely what's going on in the scene. But if we zoom in, of course the scene is pretty noisy. And why is that? One sample can be only used for so much. As we've seen in our previous flashy example, we need a lot of rays to do all of the things that rays are doing in the scene. We need camera rays that go to the light, we need rays that go into reflection, we need rays for exploring the global illumination, so spread around the scene. And because our scene is more complicated than the example, there are rays bouncing between the objects and that means there is need for even more rays. As you can see, some of the pixels are black and that means in this case the ray that was shot through the pixel, that one sample, did not find the light source. And some pixels are very bright, that means those pixels definitely have found the light source and those were reflection rays while the red pixels here were the diffuse distributed pixels that also found a light source. And of course the more samples I shoot, let's try 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. You can see the noise gets smaller and smaller and we get more and more picture information. And this is usually also a good thing to mention that usually the noise is cut in half by doubling the samples. So going from 64 to 65 samples won't do any good. You have to go to 128 samples 
to see a noticeable difference. And this already concludes this week's quick tip. I hope you found it interesting and know a little bit more about sampling than before. If you find this kind of video interesting, let me know in the comments whether you like this way of explaining stuff, or if not, what you would prefer. In any case, I hope that you liked this one. Thank you very much for watching and happy sampling. Bye.